the next session. I call upon Sri C. A. Suchit Kumar, our esteemed senior vice president, to escort our guest speaker, Mr. G. Monkora, executive director and CEO, Main Canker Ingredients, onto the stage. Also, I request him to introduce the guest to the audience. President of Calicut Management Association, Engineer Anandamani, distinguished dignitaries, our speaker for second session, Sri Jiman Kora, members of CMA, invited guests, students, ladies and gentlemen. A warm good morning to all of you. With great pride and pleasure, I welcome each and every one of you to the second session of CMA Silver Jubilee Annual Management Convention. Sessions are on where are we heading in the changed world order with expert speakers leading each session. Understanding of the topic will help us to build a good success in our life in the changed world order. Having a vision and mission in our life is very vital to achieve glory in our life. Along with that, now it is imperative to have a clear understanding of how world has changed post-pandemic as the changes are so vital and changed from the traditional era. For business class as well as for those in employment and for students aligning their vision and mission in tune with the exchange is very much imperative as we all are living in a global village. Taking positively, Post-pandemic, a lot of innovations emerged, especially in digital learning, digital payments, online business, IT, and logistics. Every industry, every profession, every service has changed from traditional era. India being the largest democratic country with a large young population and economy poised for 5 trillion economy by 26-27 and 30 trillion in next 30 years. It is very essential to have an introspection of where we are heading in the changed world order post-pandemic. Many countries becoming financially very weak and collapsed without having proper understanding of these changes. I'm not taking much of the time as we have to hear from our expert speaker for this and also from many other speakers that is following. We are fortunate today to have a renowned speaker on CMA Silver Jubilee Annual Management Convention, none other than Sri Jimon Kora, MD and CEO of Mane Kankor Ingredients Private Limited, Ernakulam. He is managing management committee member, All India Spices Exporters Forum, executive committee member, International Federation of Essential Oils and Aroma Trade, co-convener, Food and Agri Panel, Confederation of Indian Industries, CIA Kerala, Flowers Committee Chair, Flowers and Fragrance Association of India, South Zone Regional Chair, Flowers and Fragrances Association of India, Executive Board Member, Indian Society of Spices, awarded as the CEO of the year 22 by Aswacham, Industry Expert and Strategic Partnerships, Acquisitions and JVs, Transition Management, Innovations, Business Reengineering, and many, many more things. Proudly present before you, Sri Jimon Kora, our expert speaker for this session. Welcome, Sri Jimon Kora, and over to you for the session. And now, Mr. G. Monkora with his presentation. Good morning. Thank you, Calicut Management Association, and all of you to have invited me over here. As I was sitting there and listening to Mr. Arun Kumar, I had to kind of restructure and recalibrate my entire uh, address, which I had originally planned because a lot of points what he's mentioned is actually quite close and you know relevant to what I do in my business. So I thought maybe I could draw parallels with that so it is more anecdotal in that sense and could relate better in my communicating those to all of you here. We spoke about global food security. Very interestingly, the kind of data that we have 
actually exposes the kind of vulnerability that exists today in global food security. Russia and Ukraine combined produce 28% of the world's wheat, 14% of corn and 44% of sunflower. So imagine clearly why your kitchen expenses have gone up if you are going to be cooking with sunflower oil. It's as simple as that. When you make chapatis, it's going to be different because you can make chapatis, but the people who, because India produces that, but there are countries such as Egypt, Ethiopia, Yemen, Bangladesh, which import from other parts of the world, and Russia and Ukraine has been the major supplier. Combined to that, what has also happened is because of this conflict, many countries have stopped exporting wheat to other countries. So the ones that don't produce these food grains are going to suffer. Now, I was in Egypt three weeks back, and very interestingly, I got to know that 52% of food grains into Egypt are imported. So what happens when that supply chain is cut off? It's not good if India alone is self-sufficient and India alone grows. This is today a global village. We don't grow if others don't grow. And there are so many such issues that come up. And when we speak about food grains, it's actually beyond that. Everything related to agriculture, security. Because when you actually go into your, in the morning you have your coffee, your tea, go into a bath, everything is actually agriculture related. You may not realize it, but when you take your soap or a shampoo and use it, you have agriculture products in it. One aspect is this global supply chain challenge. Also combine this with climate change, what's happening. Being in the industry, I can tell you that while there has been significant change over the years in terms of productivity of food grains, a lot of other crops have actually suffered. Because the priority has been self-sufficiency in food for many countries, including India, we have, in effect, neglected a lot of other indigenous crops that have been traditionally grown in India, and that's losing out. Simple example from my industry is a product which probably all of you know as pultailam, lemongrass oil. When I came into the industry many years ago, lemongrass oil was naturally, it was grown in Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, and there are components in this oil which is about um, what you would call the critical, you know, the key actives in lemongrass oil, and one, one component is citral. You used to get about 75-76% citral in lemongrass. You used to get about 80% geraniol in palmarosa oil. Today, by nature, you get 65-67% to 67 of citral, about 70% of geraniol in palmarosa. This is how crops are getting affected. This is a major concern. It may not actually Many of you may not be aware of this, but very similar to this, it is happening across the world in every single crop. Turpentine is one of the most important precursor to every aroma chemicals that is made in the world. And it comes from pine. What happens when there is global warming? Pine trees die, there is a global shortage of turpentine, Everything that we use in daily life is, will be affected. But this is the kind of impact. So it's not just food security. It is basically we are going, we are at a, at a phase where we are literally rewriting everything that nature has provided us. How do we reverse this? And how can we kind of complement nature with things that we do? We'll come to that. But I'm just putting across here the challenges that we have. Of course, man is very intelligent and ingenuous, we will come with solutions, which is why there is always hope in whatever we do. So clearly, these are challenges which can be overcome, and which should be overcome, and which shall be overcome by human intervention. Just as much as we probably did not do anything to protect what we have, there are things that we will do 
to also create something new. Regulations, the regulatory changes that are happening in the industry. Now, very simple example. We have registered about, let's say, about 400 pesticides in India. Now, these pesticides have been in use in India for probably last 25, 30 years. These pesticides are no longer being used in other parts of the world because they are outdated, gone, because of their residual toxicity. New molecules have come in. Again, in agriculture, you are going to use the pesticides that are available to you, to your farmers, from his corner store, and he is cultivating it. And you export this. You wish to export this. It gets rejected. Why? Because it is not listed anymore in Europe or in the US. So there is this disparity that has happened over time because of the economies and how we have not been able to adapt to the new changes and there is a necess necessity to increase our speed of global integration in many ways including this because the, the same chemical companies I'm not going to name the big ones, you all know the big ones. They have stopped producing it in Europe, but they produce it in India. Okay? So your farmers don't have an alternate option. They have to buy what is produced in India. Because that's what is cheap and what is economical, what they have been using all these years, no change. And what happens also is, slowly and steadily, these chemicals do not have the same effect what it had 10 years back. Because your pests have also become more resilient. So unless this changes, we are not going to be competitive in the long run. So clearly, there is an awareness today that this has to change. We also understand several other regulations, like the REACH regulation, which has come up. There is also something called the National, you know, the Nagoya Protocol, which is called the National, in India, it's called the National Biodiversity Act. What it says is that every resource, flora and fauna of India, if it's going to be used uniquely, it has to be registered and there has to be an access benefit to the farmers who actually are cultivating it. How does this work in India? It's still on paper. And the way it is interpreted is when something is exported, you have to give something to the government. Does it reach the farmers? No. So the implementation mechanism has also to change. We have understood what needs to be done we have not started working towards implementing it. There are areas where we have done very good. IT sector, as Ma'am Aruna yesterday spoke, and today I think we'll have Mr. Koshi also speak very uh, in detail about what we have done in IT sector. There's so much more because India is blessed with the kind of natural wealth which we need to use right. So I spoke about you know, food security, it was just a continuation of what prompted my thoughts after I listened to Mr. Arun Kumar. So, continuing onwards, again, geostrategic world map. Mr. Arun Kumar touched upon it, and I'm going to actually kind of speak about it a little further on this. Russia is very well aligned with China. That's very clear. Yesterday, Ambassador Srinivasan spoke about it. Mr. Arun Kumar, with his vast experience, also alluded to that fact. But what has also happened is, because of that, that alignment, in effect, Russia is weak and China is also weakened because it's aligned very strongly with Russia. So what's going to happen is US and Europe, as we all see and we understand, is that they have kind of rethought their priorities and said that we need to be together and we need to figure a way out to manage businesses without China or without Russian gas. So there is that thinking that is here. Is it good for India? Probably yes, but then we still are a little dependent on Russia for a few things. And China is the only one concern area for us. Thankfully, China is probably only one concern area for the rest of the world as well for the balance 180 countries. So in that sense, we are aligned to the world. What will also happen is 
if US dollar loses its prominence as it's the major currency of the world, China is going to lose big time. So there is a flip side to China holding 3.2 trillion US dollars. They are probably holding the highest amount of US reserves outside of the US. So it could work both ways. If China becomes stronger, they still lose. If China becomes weaker, they still lose. So think about it. It's out there. It's a catch-22 for China. In terms of economic growth, if China continues the way it is growing at a rate of about 6% per annum in its uh, growth, and US continues to grow at about 2, 2.5%, in about 10 to 12 years, China will be the number one economy of the world. However, India is also growing at about 6 to 7, 8% sometimes as well. So what happens in early, I would say, in 1600s and 1700s, between India and China, we had 50% of the world's GDP. India had 27, China had 23, and then colonization happened, and we ended up in 1947 having about 3% of the world's GDP. Over time, this will change. It is expected that by 2030, India would probably be in the top three or four. But we are still in terms, of, when we say about the top three or four, uh, today I think US is are about uh, 20, 22 trillion, uh, China is about uh, 12 to 13, and India is probably around three or four. Is that right? Yeah. Thank you. So we are still way, way out. But that also gives us the opportunity to grow at a much faster pace. And that is where we have our strength. Because today, in terms of the young world population, guess which country has the highest young, male, uh, young um, population? India. That's where we stand first. Now, that young population is also a very intelligent population. Right? I am standing in IAMK, so I would like to hear an emphatic yes. 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 So very clearly, that is the strength. That is our, that is our GDP. You youngsters are our GDP. That's where India will make the change happen. Now let's look at the workforce of the future. Again, going by the previous speaker, if you look at the workforce of the um, future, it's actually going to change. There are going to be four types of workforces, what we call the four worlds of, the, uh, four worlds of work in 2030. The first is called the red world. Red world is where innovation rules. It's a perfect incubator for innovation with organizations and individuals racing to give consumers what they want. Digital platforms and technology with winning ideas and niche profit makers to flourish. So business will innovate to create personalization and to serve the customers in new ways. The second is the blue world, where corporate is king. Size of the organizations and influence to protect profit margins. This happened actually many years back. Um, everybody here knows Toyota or owns a Toyota. Toyota at some point of time literally ruled Japan by, you know, dictating everything that Japan had to do in terms of policies. That's what size does in corporations. To an extent, we are also seeing it in India now. It's always been happening in the US. But we, and uh, I, I was, I'm actually reading a very interesting book called The Deals That Made the World and 
that we don't know of. So if you get a chance to read that book, please do. Very interesting. As to what something happens on a golf course in the US actually has an impact between what happens between two countries in Asia. And that's facts. These are facts. The third world is called the green world, where corporate responsibility is a business imperative with strong social conscience and a sense of environmental responsibility. And the fourth is called the human world, where workers and companies seek out greater meaning and relevance in what they do, where humanness is highly valued. So these are probably the four worlds that we will probably see in 2030. In 2030, perhaps we can reconvene for the Calicut Management Association meeting here. <laughs> Mr. Anandamani, please don't forget to invite me. <laughs> now I come to one other area of interest for the future, which is the metaverse. How many of you are aware of what metaverse is? Yes. So, yeah. So I'm sure there are experts here in this room who will speak in detail about metaverse going forward. But imagine a world where you could have a beachside conversation with your colleagues, take meeting notes while floating around a space station, or teleport from your office in London to New York or Mumbai or Tokyo without stepping out of your front door. So what is Metaverse? How many of you here actually know this old uh, TV serial by Gene Roddenberry, Star Trek? Star Trek? Raise your hands, please. Okay, few hands, okay. So you have much more of a young crowd here who are more into Star Wars than Star Trek. <laughs> so in Star Trek, actually, you know this famous words, beam me up, Scotty? That is a very advanced version of Metaverse. Probably you'll never come to that because technically that device actually transforms matter into energy and transforms that energy back into matter. I don't know whether science will ever get to that stage in our lifetime or for the next few lifetimes. It might get there, but Metaverse is without actual transformation of matter to energy. It's hologram, it's visual 3D um, perfection, where I can actually have this conversation with you. My hologram would be standing here and having this conversation with you. I don't have to drive down from Cochin to Calicut at breakneck speed to be here at 8.30 in the morning. That changes. Everything changes. Imagine the possibilities. Okay, you want to have a meeting with somebody in the US today. Uh, in fact, tonight I'm actually flying out to France. If Metaverse and Madam Aruna, this is something which you could actually focus on because this is the next future of internet, clearly. Because India has taken the internet world by storm. We have the best brains and we literally produce everything that is imaginable in today's internet. What is tomorrow's internet and how can we prepare ourselves for that? That's the challenge which we pose towards all these youngsters here and to us as well. How do we facilitate and create the new hub of metaverse in India? So, you know, I'm, I'm sure we will get to all that uh, details. I'm sure people will look up metaverse. I had some notes on that, but I thought that's probably not relevant right now. It's going to change the world from what it is today, just as much as internet has changed the world from what it was in 1980s and 90s. That's what metaverse will do. What is not going to change? What is not going to change? Every, we, we talk about every change that is going to happen, but what is not going to change? Human interactions, our mindset, and how we work, it's probably not going to change in our thought processes, but we are going to change in how we implement technology
to drive those thought processes and those interactions. One very important aspect of all of this is leadership. And I want to touch upon that very simply. I had the good fortune of um, traveling to Leh and Ladakh in 2017 for, and as it happened, we were a bunch of uh, cars sponsored by Overdrive and Audi. So you're driving through all that place and it was coordinated by the Indian Army. The whole trip was coordinated by the Indian Army because it's all very sensitive areas. And it's, it's, it's so cold that you couldn't sleep at night and there's hardly any oxygen there. So at three in the morning, we have these small tents put up there and we are trying to sleep but we can't because you can't breathe. If you lie down, you can't breathe because your chest compresses. That's when you really appreciate what the Indian Army does out there. So we had to literally sit in our tents and after some time the tent is so cramped so we got out. Me and my friend, we got out of the tent and we see that the rest 20 people are also standing out because none of them can sleep and none of them can breathe. So we also stood up. We can see the mountains out there with the Chinese bunkers, the lights on the Chinese bunkers. So uh, literally nobody is in a conversational mood because we are hardly breathing. So next day we drive and we go to this place called Renzang La. How many of you are aware of the war of Renzang La in 1962? How Razang La. Yes, so I was going to ask that. How many of you have any army background here in this room? Your parents, your brother, sister, anybody? Yeah, so we have a few. So I'm sure you would have heard about Razang La. So we went there, we hoisted the flag and then as we hoisted the flag and we sang the national anthem, a great sense of pride and also the army personnel who were accompanying us told us the story of Razangla. It's in the history of battles, human battles, it ranks in the top 10 battles of the world. How many of you have heard this? I have a hand there, yeah. This is a battle that was fought between India and China. And these battles will continue to be fought. That's not going to change. And I hope the result of the battle also will not change in future because India won that. 124 people, 124 of our soldiers, led by Major Shaitan Singh. 13 Kumar Regiment. 124 beat back close to 3,000 Chinese soldiers. Just imagine. I get goosebumps even talking about it right now. <laughs> this Shaitan Singh just simply said one thing to his people. We will not let them pass as long as we are alive. That was it. Out of the 124, 114 Just 10 survived. But we won that battle. This is leadership. This is what leadership inspires. This is not going to change. I hope it doesn't change. With that, I will end my short address. Thank you all. <laughs> Mr. Jiman Kora has laid bare the third post to the global supply chain of food, agricultural produce, due to the tensions across the world, climate changes, and other challenges. Knowledge is having the right answer, and intelligence is asking the right questions on how we take on these challenges. So there we have hope in the human intelligence, which will help us tide over the ocean of challenges. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful session. Now, delegates, it's question answer time. Please get that mic and put your questions, please. I'm Colonel Nisa Siti, an army veteran, retired about seven years back. And he's from my regiment. I'm from 4 Kumau, he's from 13 Kumau. And I'm so thank you from the bottom of my heart. You know, 
you have finally concluded with that battle. I mean, unbelievable battle. I have only one question, rather a concern. Our biggest asset now, as far as India is concerned, is our young blood, almost 60% plus. But if you don't engage them in the right track with employment and other opportunities, that big asset can become a very difficult liability. Even with that new <laughs> Agnipath, I have my concern. Okay, of course, it's a wonderful thing. Let uh, people come over and experience for four years what is army and the basic uh, discipline. But after four years, the youngster with so much of training, so much of weaponry training, you know, if they are not taken care in the right earnest, they can become the biggest problem for our country. So what's your take on that, sir? Thank you. A question which is completely out of my expertise zone, <laughs> but from a from a industry perspective, I can tell you when I heard about this Agnipath, and you know this is something which uh, you know I, I travel all around the world. I've been to countries where the system works, and what the system does is to give amazing discipline to its citizens. Singapore, <laughs> Israel. And you talk about many other countries do that. And when, when I was traveling in Israel, I'm, I'm speaking to my vendor there. And uh, we went to the Gaza to show us, uh, he wanted to show us where Gaza was. And we are having this conversation. And he said, I am a Major General so and so of the Army. And he's a common man. In Israel, every person is on duty at any point of time to be called by the government if needed. That's discipline and he respects and honors that role that he plays. Every human, every citizen of Israel is the army of Israel. Singapore has this exact same, you know, where two years, I, I think at the age of 18 or 19, uh, children go through that. They come out as completely transformed citizens. So much of responsibility. Now if we do this right, I'm sure it becomes the most important and most powerful tool for the industries. The biggest challenge what industries have today is the unemployability of the youngsters coming out of colleges today. There's no bigger challenge than that, that for us as an industry. Here, you have people who at least know what discipline is to follow organizational ethics, ethos, have certain value systems, responsibilities to the nation. You pick them up. And you, the industry, I'm sure, will come forward to bring those people up and train them, develop the right skill sets. I'm sure, of course, you know, some of them will migrate, go out, which will anyway happen. You will have a certain amount of brain drain. But today, you are actually upskilling. This whole process is upskilling everybody. So that, I believe, is an amazing opportunity for the industries to take up. The IT industry didn't come up because the government asked the IT industries to start employing people. They grew on their own. And then the government took notice of what was happening and started supporting. This will happen. This is a process of evolution. I'm sure it will happen when we get to see people who are qualified with the right mindset and the attitude. Because as, an, as a person of the industry, for me, I pick people from all the top institutes around India. The most important thing I've told my team when they go out there is not to look at the first rankers and the second rankers or third rankers. Of course, they are welcome, but look at the people with the right attitude. Attitude, you can, uh, attitude cannot be taught. <laughs> you, can always ups, you can always give the right skill sets if the person has the right attitude. That attitudinal change will happen when people go through these and then you will have a transformed nation. But surely, there are pitfalls in the way today Agnipath is designed that has to change. It cannot be a one-dimensional view of how things have to evolve, which also I'm opposed of. It has to be a more holistic perspective, and I'm sure it will bring those changes what we want. Let's do it, because this change is necessary. This is our country's biggest asset. Our biggest resource is our young people. How do we make the best use of it? 
That's everybody. Everybody here has a role to play in that. Surely, I hope I've answered. Now, our country is mainly an, an agri economy, and we are. Uh, we need more things to do for the value addition agri economy. Any um, query by the our young generation who are depending more on this agri studies and all those things. Any questions to our speakers? Um, hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mahindran. I'm the uh, regional credit director of one of the advertising agency, and I'm running a business with uh, Srinath, who is one of my partner. So I have one um, question about, like, you are talking about the four stages of the business, right? So we got it the first and two, and the third one you specifically said that the, the, the green belt, the green part of the business, right? So how much we have done in terms of like sustainability in the business part, especially in Kerala, for example, uh, most of the people are here, the management expertise and uh, many, most of them are running companies, but I barely see any sustainability product or a sustainability ma management in companies. And how do you take that into a next level as an, as an industry expert? Sustain, this is interesting question, but I will also mention that sustainability is not only of what you see that is happening. Sustainability has a lot of other factors which companies do by nature. And I'll, I'll talk from my company's perspective. Over the last 40 years, all our boilers in our factory run through the waste that we generate from the factory. That's sustainability for you. And it didn't happen yesterday or today. 40 years it's been happening and it will also happen in the future. Now we are also have solar power coming in. This is sustainability. Now we don't advertise it. We don't speak about it. This is a way of life. Just as you wake up in the morning and brush your teeth, this is how you think about how you kind of use lesser energy or develop your own, create your own en energy for your usage. That is sustainability. We work with 3,000 farmers and the very interesting pointer I actually wanted to um, add on to what Mr. Arun Kumar mentioned he, about him going to uh, um, a place and finding that farmers have these apps. Kolar. We actually work with 3,000 farmers in Telangana, almost 10,000 farmers in UP. We have given them our app. They send us pictures of how the crop is. We send them back what the remedies are and how to fix it. And this is done on a continuous basis. This is about also taking along with us all the farmers who are working with us and who are also not working with us. They also benefit from the, this is also sustainability. This is about sustainable farming because you may or may not benefit from this process, but you are making a change to that environment. And if you go to Badrachalam today in uh, AP Telangana, and if you go to the areas of Bareilly, you will see the change that is happening with the farmers and their mindset itself. Today they are not looking at marrying off their children at uh, 14 years and 15 years. It's an amazing transformation over the last 20 years. That people have realized that their children can do so much more better even in agriculture. By studying agriculture because it, it is also now giving them the returns which probably they didn't have before. So you are actually re-modeling uh, how agriculture economy can sustain because we are still dependent on agriculture. More than 42% of our workforce is in agriculture even today. Active workforce. Can that 42% of active workforce continue to be even more productive? Even if it reduces down, uh, China is down to almost 3 or 4% actually. They have gone fully industrialization. But with us, we may not go to that levels of industrialization over the next 5 or 10 years. In which case, how do you improve the lives and livelihood of these farmers? That is also sustainability. Now these are things that we probably do not tom tom, but the industry is doing quite a bit of this. I can assure you about that. Uh. We, are, we are running out of time. Any questions? One more question.
up with the 17 sustainable goals raised by UN in 2015 and it was very interesting your message about the agriculture evolution. We have come up with something called zero chip farming in the world. This is first in kind of it's in the world. We have already started up this. And I was in Delhi last week with ICRA, that is the All India Robotic Council for Robots and Automation. And I'm the advisory member of that. The question here, coming to the question, in order to overcome the biggest problem of self-sufficiency, now we are depending on 80% of our agriculture, vegetable things from Karnataka or Tamil Nadu, keeping our land resources and human resources idle, whereas we are talking about digital transformation technology. So how we make aware of this particular I mean, the, the people, uh, you know, living within Kerala or all over India to, to embrace all this technology and to take it into the next level rather than keeping all these resources idle. Thank you. Interesting question, and this is very relevant to Kerala, especially. Um, these are, um, there are certain policy issues that has actually um, been a handicap for us. So fundamentally, we have land available. And there is this uh, policy that says that um, paddy land cannot be used for anything and anything else. Unfortunately for us today, paddy land is not being used for paddy as well. OK? So that's one point. The second point is we have a lot of plantations, plenty of plantations all over Kerala. But there are only designated plantation crops that can be cultivated there. Taking these two. Um, very key and critical areas into consideration. I'm currently the chair of Kerala uh, Zone, uh, Kerala State Council at uh, CII. We have something called the Government CII Consultative Forums, GCCF. We met last August, uh, this uh, earlier this month in August, on August 8th, with the Chief Secretary and close to about 15 principal secretaries of all departments. Every department, all the bureaucrats were there and the chief secretary chaired the session and I was part of the uh, CA delegation that went in there. These two policy changes have been requested. It's not easy to make policy changes in a democracy. So that is what democracy is also all about. We talk about democracy, the good things of democracy and the bad things of autocracy. So. Democracy has its challenges in terms of the fact that there is going the process of change will be slow. But the fact is, these have been heard, these have been understood, and they have promised to come back to us with what is possible on a stepwise basis. First thing that has already happened is that plantation, the uh, plantations is also now under industries. And there is a relaxation of up to 5% of the plantation area can be non-plantation crops. We have also requested for re-looking at the list of plantation crops to add more plantation crops into it, which means then the plantations can be used for more crops than what it is today. There's another way of doing it. So there are different ways to skin a cat, if I put it that way. We have to get there. It's not that this is not under our purview. It is under our purview from the industry's purview. We will drive this change and hopefully when I come back here in 2030, if Ananda Mani invites me, we will have this discussion where <laughs> <laughs> we'll have this discussion where we say that okay, now we have we are self-sufficient. I hope that day is not too far away. Thank you. With us, uh, session two comes to its conclusion. My request are ever agile and smart to the co-past president, Professor Philip Anthony, to present the guest with the pleasantry on behalf of CMA. Thank you, Mr. Sujit Kumar, and thank you, Philip, sir. And thank you, especially Sriman Kora, for your amazing presentation and sharp answers to the questions.